All right, well, good morning, everyone. As always, it's a great delight uh, to be together. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at the Resolve Church, uh, serving alongside a wonderful team of other men and women, of course, all of us serving under our head pastor, Jesus. And that's really what we truly believe, is that though I am the guy that you unfortunately see most weeks up here, preaching and teaching most Sundays, I am not the head pastor. Surprise, surprise. Uh, We really do believe that Jesus is the head pastor, leading us and guiding us, caring for us, protecting us, Uh, you know, all those kinds of things, ministering to us by his word and his Holy Spirit and his saints. And so uh, me and the other team of pastors, we really submit to Christ and we do follow him and look to him for all things. A couple of things before we get started. Uh, First is, of course, our Theology 101 course is getting solid, started next Sunday. If you're new to the church, kind of interested in checking us out a bit more, please come. It's a great eight-week class. I know, more learning, right? Uh, but it's a really, really wonderful way to get to know more about who we are as a church, what we believe and teach. It's extremely comprehensive in terms of covering a whole breadth of topics. How can we know that there is a God? Why do we trust the Bible? What's human nature and its relationship to sin? Who's Jesus? What did he come to accomplish? What does salvation even look like? What's the church, the purpose of the church? All of these topics and these questions we will address in that class. So starting next Sunday, after the service, around like 12 p.m. or so, uh, we're going to get started. So please show up or sign up on the website, theresolve.com. Second is uh, our other theology class that we're getting started also next Sunday is our hermeneutics class, Theo 211. Uh, At one point, we're going to get accredited (laughs) to like give you guys credit for all those things you guys are learning. Uh, Hermeneutics is just a big fancy word for how to study and interpret the Bible the right way, because there's a lot of ways to do it really bad and wrong. Uh, And so we want to help you guys be equipped uh, as God's people with God's Word. Uh, And so that's going to be at 2 p.m. on Sunday, next Sunday. We have a few people already signed up. It's it's a lot of fun, trust me. Uh, It's a little bit different format. So we meet every other Sunday. Uh, and every time we get together, it's kind of like a classroom setting, but the primary bulk of the class is going to be the homework, because if you're going to actually learn how to read and interpret the Bible, you need to read and interpret the Bible. <laughs> so uh, we give you some tools and some handholds on how to do that well, and then we uh, have you guys practice it, and then we circle back and make sure you're not falling into heresy. So it's a, it's a great little uh, exercise. Uh, so if you guys are interested in doing that and joining in with the class, it's already kind of growing, please talk to me after the service. All right. Well, now that Advent's over and the New Year's is done, we're all off and running into our respective lives with uh, 2022. It's time to jump back into really diving into the book of Hebrews. It took a couple of weeks to kind of finish up Hebrews chapter 11, uh, but we're going to be really focusing on Hebrews now uh, until basically the end of of Hebrews. My goal is to be done by Easter this year, uh, and then we'll jump back into our, we'll jump into our new book of the Bible. And that's the thing, is we as a church study books of the Bible. We really believe that God, uh, really His Word is what does His work in our lives, and we are led by God through His Word. And that studying the Bible, you know, verse by verse, exegetically through it, is the best way to be led by God in His Word. And since the end of January of last year, we've been in the book of Hebrews. Uh, If you guys are kind of joining us recently, the book of Hebrews is 13 wonderful chapters. It's hard to call it a book. It's actually a sermon. So some spoilies, I've already got my last sermon written because I'm literally just going to read the book of Hebrews (laughs) Uh, because it is a sermon. It's literally a sermon that's been recorded for us. And that's one of the wonderful, glorious things about God's Word is so, and we'll learn in our hermeneutics class, there's a lot of different literary styles that we have here, like poetry, wisdom, historical narrative, doctrinal uh, letters, all kinds of different things, and a sermon that would have been read to the church. And so that's going to be my last, I'm going to read it from front to back, no commentary (laughs) from me. Uh, It'll be kind of fun to hear it kind of flow in that way. But Hebrews is a book, uh, we don't know who the exact author is. Uh, At the very beginning of our time last year, I made uh, an argument for why I in uh, Pauline authorship, you know, the Apostle Paul writing it, uh, but because we don't know for sure who wrote it, I mean, the, the author's name is never mentioned, I think God intended that for us to be reminded of the role of the Holy Spirit in writing Scripture, that this is divinely written. Behind every book of the Bible, there's always two authors, uh, the Holy Spirit and the human agent. I think that God uh, kind of met that, kept that a little bit of a mystery for us with Hebrews 
to really emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in giving us and preserving this for us today. And really the goal of the book of Hebrews is to highlight the glories of Christ, to show the supremacy of Christ over everything. The church that the writer is writing to is, is similar to us, kind of a church about this size in the first century that were being beleaguered in so many ways to go back into uh, maybe the old ways of, of Judaism and the law, right? Temple worship and, and following the law, kind of like the Apostle Paul, or into licentiousness and, and paganism with the Gentile believers coming out of paganism. They're being pulled in these different ways to abandon Christ, to abandon the faith that they had received and they had believed on and was beginning to change their lives because of the resurrection. The book of Hebrews is very similar to a lot of the New Testament books. Kind of the primary bulk of it is going to be largely theological in nature, kind of doctrinal, kind of the wow of the gospel. And then you get to some practicals and how that actually hits kind of our life, kind of the now of the gospel. Now, Hebrews, uh, the now part of the gospel starts around chapter 10. Not that it's not interspersed with different warnings and different things. One of the primary warnings in Hebrews is don't drift away from the faith. Don't let anything begin to separate you from the community of God's people, from the communion with Christ. Don't drift away. It's so easy to get kind of sidetracked, and we just begin to slowly move away from the church. I think our pandemic has certainly made that very highlighted, how easy it is to be, kind of drift away from the faith, to drift away from the things of God and let other things crowd in, other fears or concerns crowd in and smother faith and love and devotion for Christ. Today we're going to be focusing, just like in the video actually, it works out well. I don't plan it to work out this way, but it worked out great, on the power of the resurrection. We're going to be focusing on the resurrection because Hebrews chapter 12, that is uh, front and center. C.S. Lewis says the central belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. In Christ, a new kind of man appeared, and the new kind of life which began in him is to be put into us. I love that. He's not getting into the mechanics, right, of how the resurrection and Christ's death kind of makes that possible. It's sufficient to know that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God. And has given us a brand new start, a new kind of life. A divine life, a God life is now given to us now. So with that kind of a background, let's go ahead and stand in the honor of reading of God's word. This is Hebrews chapter 12, just the first two verses, chapter verses 1 and 2. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Uh, two points that follow the, just kind of the two verses here, right? Verse 1 and verse 2. The first point we're going to talk about is life and community. The idea we have a transformed life because of the resurrection. And the first aspect of this transformed life is that now we have life in community. We can actually live in true communion with one another. The second, of course, is going to be our life in Christ himself and what that kind of looks like in our own personal lives. Starting with community because that's how verse 1 starts, right? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we're surrounded by this cloud. Now, what is this cloud? It's not a cloud in the sky. It's the Greek idiom to talk about a large gathering of people. It's the only time it's actually used here in the New Testament. It's kind of interesting. It's not this ethereal kind of thing. Now, who is he talking about prior to this? Well, obviously, if we remember anything about Hebrews 11, there's a whole list of names, a whole bunch of people in the Old Testament that the apostle has already given to us about what it looks like to have faith in Christ. So that's obviously, there's... Old Testament saints, right? They were witnesses to the power and the truth of Yahweh in the world. The kind of life that we're called to live, the kind of redemption that he offers, the promises, of course, of Christ that are already there. That is, in part, some of the cloud of witnesses, these Old Testament saints. You know, so I think it's really important for us as New Testament believers to be immersing ourselves in the history of our people, right? To really know 
these people who are witnessing the power and truth of Christ. But not just the Old Testament saints that, you know, kind of immediate prior context to this verse, but also the New Testament saints as well for the church that they were existing in. I mean, it wasn't just uh, this church sort of off in the middle of nowhere and just kind of good luck. I mean, they're interconnected with one another. Letters are being passed around all the time. Disciples would go and visit other cities or other towns or other villages or other provinces. Apostles were roaming around. I mean, they were all interconnected with one another. They had this great body of witnesses witnessing to the power and the truth of Christ, who is the incarnated Son of God. We also have, of course, now. We are surrounded by one another. We have witnesses in our lives, legacies of Christ. Not just our own church body here, which is certainly true, but we have other churches in our city, other churches throughout the world that are part of this covenant community of God. And it really got me thinking about legacy, because the, the whole kind of point and thrust of this part of the verse is that this witness of these saints, Old Testament, New Testament, present-day saints, not Latter-day Saints, present-day saints, uh, their witness is to encourage us, to inspire us, their legacy is to en- encourage us to run this race with endurance. That's what we saw in the little video. You know, to run with endurance, because we're doing it with other people. I was in a marching band. I bring up my marching band days uh, in high school and college. And uh, I'm going to go with my college days because in high school, I was the leader. I was the drum major. So, so cool. Uh, So let's talk about my college days. I didn't get to be drum major in college because I thought it was too cool for that. Uh, But what's interesting about being in a marching band is it's really hard. It's like really difficult to be in a marching band. Uh, you're, You're sort of doing this thing with a whole bunch of other people you know, 150 to 200 other people, and especially if you're in DCI. If you're nerdy enough to know what DCI is, congratulations. Uh, if you're in DCI, that's like epic level, professional level marching band. My brother, my wife, they did DCI. They're crazy intense people. But it's, it's a lot of work. And it's really, really physically taxing. But it's so much easier to do that, to produce this wonderful show when you're doing it with a lot of other people who are doing it in lockstep with one another. This is why we need each other. This is why we need not just kind of, you know, sort of disembodied relationships, whether on social media or Zoom, but we need embodied physicality with one another. We need to be with and around one another. We need each other for this. One of the things I was thinking about when it comes to family, because I was thinking about the legacy of my family. I've been blessed to have a legacy of my dad, my my father-in-law, my grandparents, uh, people who invested me deeply in college, uh, a legacy of men uh, who really love Christ, uh, and they really showed what a life of faithfulness looked like. I'm blessed by that. I didn't realize what kind of a blessing that was until I became a Christian, became a grown-up, and then started having kids of my own even realize this, man, how rich that is, and what a wonderful blessing that is. They're not blessing me with stuff. They're blessing me with a legacy of faithfulness to Christ, which is a blessing. But the thing is, we don't always get to pick our families, right? We don't get to choose the family that I'm born into. We don't get to choose the brother or the sisters or the aunts or the uncles that are part of my family. Like, you didn't get it. God didn't come to you and say, like, okay, you want to be part of this family, you know? You just are right there, and we're called to love those that we are in. We are called to love as best we can those that God has placed into our lives. And I believe that it's kind of the same as the church family, right? We don't always get to, you know, not all the cool kids get to be part of our church, <laughs> especially if I'm here. <laughs> the cool kids are not going to be part of this church. One of the great uh, movies that came out recently, if you guys ever saw the, the movie Encanto, you guys seen that yet? That was really exuberant. <laughs> Uh, one of the characters that uh, I feel really bad about, of course, is Bruno, right? We don't talk about Bruno, uh, but it's kind of sad, right? They didn't, like, he's one of the three. You know, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but other than you guys know this, they all have special powers, but they didn't like Bruno's power, right? They didn't like the power that he was given by the house, I guess, and so they kind of ostracized him, and of course, you know how Disney is. They end up bringing them back in, and it's happy, and all kinds of stuff. But I just kind of think about that with us as a church. You know, I think we really need to take seriously to love one another, love those that God has brought us with that kind of 
intentionality, the kind of covenantal love that we experience as a family. Because this is, this is what's going to enable us to actually run the race with endurance. We need one another. And the reality is that we're going to hurt each other. Right? We're going to sin against one another. We're going to say things we don't mean. We're going to say things we do mean that are really mean. We're going to, like, you know, sin against each other. Uh, that's just part of being a family. And I think when we have the covenantal mindset, it really enables us to say, you know, that person said this thing to me or did this thing to me, intentional or unintentional, but you know what? Instead of just cutting and running, I'm just going to go to a different church. It's easier that way. I'm actually going to push into relationship. I'm going to push into and seek to resolve or reconcile that relationship. That's scary, isn't it? That's hard to do. And yet that's the kind of life that God has called us to have together because I really believe that that's how we experience the grace of Christ. That's how we really believe and experience the grace of Christ in our lives. We're covenanted to one another. We're part of the greatest movement in the cosmos. Why did God create anything at all? It's for the church. To display the glories of Christ as head over the church. To be part of the church, God's people, there's nothing greater, no other greater legacy that anything will ever have. Any other legacy of humankind will fade and wither and be burned up in the end. Not the church of God. And in Christ, we're saved, redeemed, into this transformed community. It's full of justified sinners. Not that I'm justified in my sin, of course, but that I am declared right with God because of Christ. Now I'm becoming who I am. For the legacy, a church community, whose legacy will last for eternity. Live in, uh, like a transformed community call to one another is to remember those who have gone before so we can inspire to live for Christ today. How is your life being an encouragement to others right now? What kind of legacy are you setting for your family, for this community, for the city? What kind of legacy will San Diego think about when it comes to the Resolve Church? So that's a transformed community that we're saved into, that we are part of. It's a glorious thing. We're surrounded by this great, wonderful cloud of witnesses. And because of that, now the author says, now, because you're in this community, now we can lay aside every weight and every sin that entangles us. We have now transformed desires. So these desires that are kind of new, that are transformed and transforming now. There's something called sin that I'm now becoming aware of. Before, did I care about my sin? Before Christ, did that really weigh on me, really weigh me down? Probably not. Just keep going happily in my sin toward hell. God says, now, no, you have a transformed desire, one that desires the things that please God, that honor him, that are good for you, that are good for human thriving, and a community that is working towards that. It's not perfect. It's stumbling around sometimes, but we're together walking in the same direction. We have a transformed desire. There's two things the author has identified, weight and sin. And he makes a distinction between these two things, weight and and sin. And I think there is a distinction between these two things. The idea of a weight is the picture of somebody holding a boulder and trying to run this marathon. I've never run a marathon, but I would imagine it would be really hard to hold a boulder and run a marathon. At some point, you know, you're just going to drop it and be tired or pass out or something. I don't know. But that's the idea of this weight, that you're intentionally holding on to something that is preventing you from truly running this race. It's becoming like a block and a hindrance to your ability to run. That's the idea of a weight. The writer here is saying that in this community now, we can actually take these weights and lay them aside and put them down. Now we're free to actually run. So what are some of the different weights in our lives that weigh us down? Well, I've just listed a few. One is past sin in our lives. Sometimes, you know, we sin. Sometimes it's a very grievous sin, and it can begin to weigh in our minds and weigh in our hearts, even if we've already confessed it and offered it to the Lord and, you know, made peace with the person I've sinned against. It can still begin to weigh on our minds. We can beat ourselves up over and over and over and over again about that. 
think sometimes it's unhelpful because we are reminded that Christ suffered for that sin. You don't need to flog yourself. He was already flogged for that. Sometimes we don't have a choice, right? Sin has consequences in our life. Sometimes those consequences do follow us. But we have the community of God's people to help us when that becomes a hindrance or a hurt. I think shame from other people is another uh, hindrance in our lives. It can be a weight that we feel. I think in this uh, climate right now, nationally, <laughs> there's a lot of shame, right, going around, flying around all over the place, a lot of shame in ways that I didn't ever experience two years ago. But it can feel like a weight that we bear. I think we as a community of God's people have an opportunity not to cast shame on people, to actually love and accept people with the kind of hospitality and the grace of Christ to point them to a better way. Failures, whether it's a, a failed relationship, failed career, failed dream, like you have something you wanted to accomplish in your life and you didn't. Uh, as parents, we feel a lot of failure a lot, don't we? As our kids in different ways. Those can begin to weigh on our minds, weigh on us, so that we actually become not looking at Christ, but looking at our failure. The worries of the world. How often do the cares of the world begin to crowd into your heart to capture your mind, to cause doubt, to cause fear? Relational strife. One of the greatest things about humanity is the fact that we are relational people. We are called to be in relationship and to have highest quality of relationship we could ever have with one another. You can have all the stuff in the world, but if you don't have good relationships, you're going to be a miserable person. On the other hand, contrary, is you don't have to have a lot of stuff, but have rich relationship and have a great, meaningful life. Relationship is really what drives our life. So when there's strife in relationship, that can be a weight. I know for myself and my wife and for those closest to me, I try to keep really short accounts. Right? If I've hurt somebody, if I've hurt my wife, if I've, you know, said something really unkind to my kids, you know, my, my family, my closest friends, right away I'm confessing it, you know, seeking their forgiveness, reconciling it. I hate to have that on my conscience. It just, it's a weight that I feel. I would encourage us all to have short accounts. Physical, mental health can be something that weighs on us, can be something that's a hindrance to our relationship with Christ. Sin that's done unto us. Man, the wounds that we can experience, the wounds that we receive from other people, those can and oftentimes last our entire lives if we don't work with it, if we don't work through it, if we don't deal with it, that can become something that will be a hindrance, like you're leading with a limp, right? You're, you're running with a limp. And I think in the community of God's people, with Christ and his resurrected life, we can deal with the sin that's been done unto us in a way that actually brings healing. Not that you erase all the memories of those things, not like you have a brain wipe, but you see it in its fullness in Christ and how he's holding that with you. I think for me, not seeing others follow or love the Lord, right? seeing others running as swiftly as they can toward hell, having not a care in the world about God or about sin, about their lives, the consequences of their actions. That can be a weight that we experience. And there's probably more. But each of these things, I think, are weights that can threaten to trip us up. Are weights that sometimes we intentionally kind of hold on to. We're called to lay aside. I think in some of these, we can become uh, tempted towards bitterness toward God or toward other people. We can be good discouraged, so we quit. On the other hand, we could also become so infatuated with the world and all that it has to offer us that our love for the Lord cools and grows cold. How are we to lay aside these burdens? Well, we're called to give them to Christ and to let him bear that. In Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for your my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or Peter says it very succinctly in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. These burdens, these weights that we feel on our minds and our souls, our consciences, 
we're called to lay them at Jesus because he cares for you. Do you really believe that he cares for you? He, he's not just God out there, so to come to me. No, he cares for you. He died and he rose again for you. You can experience the freedom and the power of the gospel in your life. How would that actually change the way that you live? If you really believed and knew that Jesus cared for you and wants to take that, and he can take that. He is eternal God. There is no amount of weight that he cannot bear in his life. Take it to God. His resurrection guarantees that he has the strength to take on our worries and our cares, to lift them up that we can be free to continue running this race, to bring honor and glory to his name. Wait. What about sin? Well, with the transformed desires, of course, now comes a transformed nature. Now we have a, a striving against sin. Other translations of this uh, kind of clinging so closely are, is that which easily entangles us. Sin that so easily trips us up, wraps itself around our ankles and, and gets us to trip and fall down. We all know the slippery slope of sin in our lives. At times, gross moral failure it doesn't happen overnight, friends. It's a bunch of small choices that we make that begin to add up. Our conscience is increasingly becoming harder and harder and harder until gross moral failure doesn't seem like a big deal at all. Might not even know that we're in it. But this, for, the, for the believer, we are very much aware of now the struggle, the battle that is raging in our souls because we have the Spirit of God. Is dwelling in us. The Spirit of God has actually healed our wills so that we could actually see Christ in His glory and desire Him and come to Him in faith. Paul says about this struggle in Galatians, I say, walk by the Spirit, it will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for the ears are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The word is the idea of a battle that's being waged now in our souls. For the non-believer, there is no battle. It's easy going, right? Easy going in sin. There's no battle. You don't have the Spirit in you convicting you of things that are going to literally kill you. It's easy. Laying in a bed of roses, drifting on down to hell. It's easy. But for the believer, we have the Holy Spirit convicting us, showing us the things that are harmful, to us and for us and showing us the best and right way of life, new life. We must be diligent to be aware of what's going on in our hearts, in our minds. Solomon, he writes in his, in his Song of Solomon, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards for our vineyards are in blossom. Here, of course, this is a wonderful uh, letter or a poet poem really written by Solomon, about his first marriage to his first wife. It's a beautiful thing, all about a healthy marriage relationship. It's a great thing. But here he's speaking about his relationship with his wife as being like a vineyard that's in bloom. It's beautiful. But it is under threat, right? It's under threat by these foxes that are coming in to try to steal all of the, the grapes and ruin the vineyard. Now, it's one thing to let one fox come in. But if a whole bunch is starting to come and you're not dealing with it, Soon, this vineyard is trashed. I think this is a relationship for us with Christ. It's like a vineyard that's in bloom. We need to be diligent and careful not to let these little things come into our lives, stealing the joy or the love, the devotion we have for Christ. As Spurgeon says, grace is the mother and nurse of holiness, not the apologist for sin. Grace is the mother and nurse of holiness, not the apologist for sin. As we understand the grace of God and Christ in our lives, it's going to inspire us and give us a new longing, a new desire to actually live a life that's honoring to God. And what is the weapon of our warfare? As we've mentioned before in this letter, it is the Spirit of God. It gives us the strength to strive against our sin, to lay it down. It is the Word of God, both incarnate and inspired, that enables us to actually see God to have the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. Hermeneutics, take the class. The church of God. 
the saints, the spirit, the scriptures, and the saints. These are the weapons of our warfare. Now, what's the vision? Right, because it's all about vision, isn't it? Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every sin and every weight that clings so closely that has run with endurance to the race that is set before us. We've talked about this race our entire life. Looking to who? Looking to Jesus. So what's the vision that we see? It's the person of Christ himself. See, he alone is sufficient to motivate us to live more fully for his glory and not my own. He alone is sufficient and worthy of all of our attention and goals in our life. If Jesus didn't come to live, die, and rise again, then yes, please, live for yourself. Eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow you die. Please, live for yourself. If he did not actually live, if he didn't actually die, if he didn't actually rise again from the dead, it's only good that you live for your pleasures. But that's not the reality, friends. The reality is that he really did live. He really did die. He really did rise again from the grave three days later. The question is this. What does it mean? What does it mean for my life now? So we transform and transition now to the second point here, which is life in Christ. I believe it means three things. First is that Jesus is a pioneer of a new kind of life. His resurrection. He's a pioneer of a new kind of life. That's what that word founder means in the Greek. It's one who has gone before. Not that he's, you know, like the CEO of a company. It's like, I'm the founder of this company. That's not what that means. So he's a, he's a pathfinder. He's going ahead, finding the safe paths for the rest of his people to follow. That's what the word founder is. He's a pioneer of a new kind of life. He rose from the dead first to show us a safe way to live, which is by faith in his own death and resurrection the safe way for eternal life by trusting him, the safe way for living our life here and now through obedience to God, to let his life shine in our lives. What's amazing about the gospel, especially in the early church, is that the scandal of the early church was not uh, the, call to sin, the call to repentance. That wasn't the scandal. The scandal wasn't the apostles telling people that you're a sinner and you need help. People knew they were sinners and they needed help. I mean, why do you think there's a whole pantheon of gods that people would look to? The Jews certainly knew that. Just look at the law, the sacrificial system, temple worship. It was all about redemption, atonement for sin. People in the first century knew they needed help. So for the apostles to say, you're a sinner, they just nod their heads. Yeah, okay, yeah, we get that. I think it's a scandal today, right? Because we've uh, believed the lie that we are essentially good people. No? So if we to say that you're a sinner, all the way down to the core of your nature, they're going to flog me out in the streets. That is the scandal. Because we believe the lie of secular humanism. That we are basically good people. Clearly we are not. Clearly the evidence shows that we are not essentially good people. But that wasn't the scandal of the early church. The scandal of the early church was resurrection from the dead. Now, for the Jews, that wasn't so much a scandal. They still was, okay, yeah, we get that. Resurrection. Most of the Jews believed in resurrection. One weird group called the Sadducees didn't. We'll ignore them for now. Most of the Jews have been like, okay, cool. We like resurrection. Like lots of promises about that. He is the God of the living, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's the God of the living, all right? But it's the resurrection of Jesus himself. That was the scandal. That was what tripped up the Jews. This man was God. He is the eternal logos made flesh. How could this be? Clearly, this is not true. For the Greeks, they had no problem with the teaching that there is one God who is eternal, who is before all things, who is the ground and source of being and existence itself. They had no problem with the teaching that God created everything out of nothing just by the word of his power. They had no problem with that. They had no problem that there was an essentially good moral order to the universe based upon the goodness of this God. They had no problem with that. The problem they had was in the resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe in life after death. That they died, and that was it. Well, I think Paul says, he quotes them. They sang, eat, drink, and be merry, right? For tomorrow we die. 
quoting the Greeks. They didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead. So what did they do with this man who clearly rose again from the dead? What kind of a hope does that give us that there's meaning in life beyond right now? It's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's crazy. That's the scandal. That's the scandal of the gospel. That's why Paul speaks of Jesus in the power of God and the wisdom of God. And as he's speaking to these uh, different groups, he speaks in Acts 17, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by what? Raising him from the dead. He's given assurance to all, to the Jews, to the Gentiles, of this day of this righteousness that is found in this man by the resurrection of the dead, of this man. True righteousness, true life, true hope can only be found in the resurrection of Christ. Now we get to experience this partially now with the resurrection of our own spirits, right? Revelation speaks kind of esoterically about these two different resurrections. Well, Augustine identified what those two resurrections are back in the 400s, easy. First is the resurrection of our spirits. Paul describes our situation in Ephesians 2. He says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, God and Christ has made us alive. The idea that we before Christ comes into our life, or just a, a corpse on a cold slab. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, and whammo! There is life. Think about it like Frankenstein's monster, right? It's alive! The electricity, lightning, comes in. Could that really happen? I don't know. But it's a great little story. But that's the idea that we have. The Spirit of God raises us up gives us life. The way in which the Spirit of God breathed into Adam way back in the garden. He said he breathed in him and made him what? A living being. This is the same kind of resurrected divine life that is now in us, in Christ, who comes to us and makes us alive. But we also have the promise, not just of the resurrection of our spirits and our hearts, but of our bodies. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. First fruits, meaning, you know, the first kind of crop, right, of anything. That first fruit, it's an indication. Whatever that first fruit is, is an indication of what the rest of the crop is going to be. And if it's a great first fruit, then you know that crop is going to be bumping. It's going to be bumping. And Jesus, eternal Logos, made flesh, resurrected from the dead, has a physical body, a glorified body, you can bet that our glorified bodies are going to be bumping. That's given to all who have faith in Christ. The second thing we have is redemption. The idea of sanctification, as we took a look at in the little kids video, right? The idea that we are being changed and transformed from one thing into another, being changed into the image of God's Son. It's the idea of perfecter. The idea of a perfecter is one who is himself the template for what we're going to look like, but he's also the one accomplishing that work in our life. That's what the word perfecter means. I love the phrase that we are becoming who we already are. In Christ, we are already his children. In Christ, we're already justified. In Christ, we have the promise of being glorified. In Christ, you are being changed into that. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is an entire life movement, friends. An entire life, an entire process of being changed. That change is so good. Man, if I ever became like I was back when I was in college, that would be the worst. I would not want, I didn't like that. I don't like that guy. Like if I could go back in time, I'd punch him in the face. You know, I just did not like, I, speaking now, of course. <laughs> I liked who it was then. 
But as Christ has begun to transform my life and change me and show me the better way to live and to be, I'm so thankful for that work. Or Philippians 2, it's a process that we're involved with as well. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Right? It is God who is at work in you. So we're to work this out. It's something that we're also participating in. Now it's going to happen, and we can be dragged through that process, or we can be leaning into that process and allow the transformation to happen. But Jesus is the one who is perfecting us. And finally, we have him ruling in our life. That's why verse 2 ends with focusing on Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. But before that, this kind of ruling happens because we see Jesus as the pathfinder going through the ways, the safe ways, it's finding joy. Jesus is the one who transforms our sorrows into joy. Right? He's the one who transforms our mourning into shouts of praise. It's a beautiful description of why Jesus went to the cross at all. It was for joy. Now, what was the joy that Jesus had fixed in his own mind as he endured the worst sufferings, physically and especially spiritually, anyone has ever endured? Four things. The joy of seeing all of his elect redeemed through his death. All of his elect given a fresh new start, a fresh life through the resurrection that his death would actually accomplish that goal, would actually accomplish the goal to save his people from sin. Second, the joy of bringing glory to the Father brought him joy. His obedience, his sacrifice, it shows us what brings glory and joy to the Father too. Obedience. Obedience to God brings joy. Third, the joy of uniting all people together. So that when we're part of the church, we are truly one, without division, without competition, without strife. Unity is always cause for rejoicing, isn't it? So, for Christ to accomplish what no human government or system has ever accomplished in the history of mankind, the true unity of all nations and tongues and people groups and tribes, that is cause for joy. Fourth, it's the joy of renewing all things in him. How does the end of the Bible look like, right? The end of the Bible looks a lot like the beginning in so many different ways. In Revelation 21, we see after God's enemies are cast into a lake of fire forever, Jesus is now sitting on his throne, ruling over his people in the new heavens and the new earth. What does he declare? Behold, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. So what does he do? How does he do this? What does he transform? What is he making new? Well, it's just ask Jesus himself. Isaiah 61, when he goes into the temple, he reads this section of Isaiah and says, this has been fulfilled, fulfilled in your hearing. Literally, I am fulfilling this right now in your hearing. What is his ministry in our life? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. This is what he renews. This is his unique ministry in our lives. He transforms our broken hearts into ones that are full of love. He transforms our spiritual poverty into riches with his riches. He transforms our captivity in sin into the freedom of the Spirit. He transforms our fear of the Lord's vengeance into the Lord's favor. He transforms our hurts into comfort. He transforms our weeping into shouts of praise. He transforms our spiritual ugliness into beauty. And he transforms our weakness and our fainting into strength and dancing. This is what he does. This is what he is doing. So this morning, we have this opportunity to respond to this wonderful message of a transformed life through faith in this resurrected Son of God. When we turn to him in faith, seeking his forgiveness, we are reconciled with God Almighty. He quickly grants 
that to us immediately in ever-increasing measure. This morning, Resolve Church, may we today come to Jesus in our lives to see our lives, our joy, our hope, and our eternity transformed through his resurrection to the glory of God alone. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to your Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us new life. We know that until you came to us, it was not a life that we desired or even cared about. But it is the best kind of life. We're thankful for the gift of you coming to us, giving us your resurrected life, the promise of our bodily resurrection. Lord Jesus, I pray today that you would help us to lean in to the work that you've begun. Help us to seek you and how you want to transform us today and all the days of our life. Help us to be a transformed community, declaring you, proclaiming you, speaking of your love and your grace into one another, encouraging one another, spurring each other on. Lord, help us to be a covenant people, a people that are dedicated one to another, reaching out with the hospitality and the grace of Christ to all who come into our sphere of influence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning. We thank you for your word. We honor you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.